Okay, so we started talking about this idea of network governance. And uh, we uh, said that we were looking at the difference between the humanistic and transactional leadership. Current system has more transactional leadership. Network governance has more humanistic uh, leadership. So we looked at the two different types of leadership. So for example, in this class, if I tell you uh, just you should develop your abilities to improve society, right? It's a good idea. You all have the ability, and especially you're young. Your brain is still very good, right? So everybody has some ability. So you can develop your ability, and then you can improve society. Is that humanistic approach or transactional approach? What do you think? Hands up. Who thinks that's a humanistic approach? Who thinks it's a transactional approach? What if I say, if you don't study, you get F grade? Is that transactional approach or humanistic approach? Transactional approach, right? Do you understand the difference? Which one do you prefer from the teacher? <laughs> you don't like transactional? You better study or you get an F. But if you do a good job, you get an A. <laughs> <laughs> or just generally, people should try to develop their abilities, make the best of themselves, right? Which one works better for you? Which one works better? Are you sure? What do you think if I, there was no grades in the university? Just everybody makes humanistic approach. Just, just you have to try and develop yourself and do well. Uh, for society. Do you think people, everybody would study hard? No. Or just they say, oh, no, great, I don't need to study now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see in the university, that's why they have a mixture of system, right? It's, you're always going to have some people who can try to not to be uh, you know, just think about the transaction, okay? So if you're running a company, what kind of people do you want to hire? People who only think about transactions or people who have a humanistic approach? What kind of people do you want to hire for your company? Humanistic, right? Well, it's the same. Before I was working with some people who were working under me, right? And I don't want to be always checking them, right? Some worker I always have to be checking because they're not working properly. If I'm not checking, they're just going to be sitting down doing nothing and not trying hard. Do you understand? Then I have to check them and I have to give them some incentive or some punishment, that kind of way. But I don't want to hire that worker the next time. I want to hire a worker who has the self-motivation. Do you understand? The worker who wants to do the best in their job anyway, because they want to do their best. So companies prefer to hire, and companies look for, that's an important point in hiring, right? This is kind of negative view of people. This one is positive view of people. So if we want to use this leadership, it's important to hire the right people. Do you understand? If we can't hire the right people, Maybe we're going to need to use this a little bit, okay? But if we hire the right people who are self-motivated and want to develop and do their best no matter what, then we don't need humanistic style can work better, okay? But also it's up to the leader. The best leaders, like we think of JFK, right, or other leaders, they have to convince the people, okay, to try hard and do their best because they have a higher goal. Do you understand higher goal? JFK, John F. Kennedy, we're going to the moon, right? Do you believe we can go to the moon? It's 1960. Do you believe people can go to the moon? No. No, right? But JFK makes the people believe in the high goal, right? We're all working together to get to the moon. So we can go to the moon, okay? And then the people start to believe, and then the people start to work. Why? Because they want to go to the moon. 
not because they're getting paid money, right? Or they're getting some punishment if they don't work, but because they see the leaders has set the high goal or vision, and they believe in the leader, and they want to follow the leader, okay? So for humanistic leadership, we need to do that kind of thing, right? Were you convinced by me today? Did you change your life because I said you need to develop your ability three minutes ago? Yes. <laughs> life has changed now. So humanistic leadership, did I make you change your vision of life? Okay, good. Then I can say I was the great humanistic leader, right? I told the students they need to develop their ability and improve society, and then the student changed their mind. Now I'm going to, Chris said, we're we have to improve the society. I don't care about the grades, just I want to do my best in the class. Right? So you get the idea, okay? That's the idea. Do you think you can do, be that kind of leader? Can you be that kind of leader? Inspire the people? to do their best, be self-motivated, hmm? okay. So let's look at some of the criticism of the current system of corporate governance. So we have some communication breakdown. If we have a top-down system, we can have like the phone call, okay, the communication breakdown. Here's the bottom and here's the top, okay, the message doesn't get through. Okay, so let's do just a short activity just to practice this. It's called, the game is called the Chinese Whispers. Okay, so we're going to do with, uh, we have six people in this row, and we have five people in this row. And then just for this game, can, can you sit here? Can you sit here? Make six, and then you two guys are going to be in this row. So you can sit here. So I'm going to show something to the person at the start, some sentence, okay? They have to whisper the sentence to the other person. You whisper to him, he whispers to her, she whispers to her, she whispers to her, she whispers to her at the back. Then the last person writes the sentence on the board. Team which gets the, team which gets the, write the closest sentence to the original one is the winner. Do you understand? So, this team has seven, but the other team has six. Okay? So, I was just showing about the example about the communication, what can happen when it goes through different layers. Okay? So, just uh, the first person, can you come here? And the first person, come here. And the first person, come here. First person, three people, one from each team, come here. Yes. Come here. One person. You come here. So I'm going to show you the sentence. Remember the sentence. Go back to your team. Whisper to that person, right? Then she's going to whisper to her. Whisper, you understand whisper? Then you whisper to her. Whisper to her. Whisper to the end person. The end person comes to the top of the room and writes down the sentence. Okay? So whoever writes down first and the correct sentence is the winner, okay? Okay, this is the sentence. <laughs>
your fitness, dude. That was the last person to come up here and write on the board. The first team to write the correct answer is the winner. So come up and write on the board if you're finished. Don't look at the other team. Just look at the other People are focused on relationships. This group, people relationship focused. People are relationship with horses. see, none of them is the correct answer. No team got the correct answer. So that's the problem when the, le when the information goes from one person to the other person, right? From the top down the situation. <laughs> communicate from one person to the next person, right? Among different layers, in the top-down system. We start with the message starts here, okay? But by the time the message gets to the director, they're hearing a different message, okay? So we can see with, with uh, the Wall Street crisis, right? The people on the front line could say, the mortgage is very risky. The mortgages we're selling are very risky. Then they tell them, and they tell, they leave out the word very, they tell the next one, the mortgages are risky, okay? And then they, they send in here, there's a little bit of risk with the mortgage, okay? And then they tell the director, the mortgages have a relation with a horse, right? <laughs> and then the director says, what? Horse. Says, oh, no, 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 I meant mortgage is a little bit risky, right? <laughs> But by the time it gets to the end person, the message is different than it was at the start. Okay? So that's one problem. Okay, so this is the this is the sentence which they have to write. People are relationship focused. Okay? So maybe the best one was the number the second group, right? They were the slowest one, but they were just left out the word R. Okay, that was just four words, right? It wasn't, I could have given you this sentence. I was going to give this sentence, right? That would have been hard, but just four words, but even then, communication can uh, get misinterpreted, people interpret differently, biased, or just false, okay? So, uh, whistleblowers can be fired when the company's reputation is at stake. So in the top-down structure, there's a whistleblower here, and they just think, if the information gets out, we lose our reputation. So it's better just to fire that person, okay? It can be a problem. Another problem is the individual bias and the group dynamics. So these are all uh, psychological issues. Uh, overconfidence, are you overconfident? Are you guys overconfident, usually, or not? People are usually overconfident in their ability, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, so
Some CEOs are very overconfident, right? Some CEOs will say, that's not a problem. Overconfidence is a good thing, right? Let's go to the moon, right? Overconfidence, okay? But other, it can be a good thing for creating the vision, but we also have to be somewhat based in reality, okay? So if the, if the people in the company may be overconfident in the group, we could have anchoring. Anchoring means that uh, I, I just go on one point and I don't change. So do you know anchor? This is an anchor, it's not changing. Okay? So uh, let's say that anchoring in negotiation, these are all important too. So let's say that we're negotiating about a car and the price of the car is $10,000. Okay? In the, in the online, on the internet. But we're negotiating. I want, I'm selling the seller, I want $12,000. Okay? And the buyer, you want $8,000. Okay? So, anchoring means that whoever says the number first, whoever says the number first, uh, we can tend to stay around that price, especially if we don't know the price, okay? So if the buyer says the number first, the buyer says $8,000, okay? It may be that in the end, the price might be 9,000, okay? If the seller says the price first, 12,000, in the end, the price might be closer to 11,000, okay? So anchor is like something heavy, so we don't move away from the initial point. Okay, so uh, the next one is escalation of commitment. Escalation of commitment means that I have, a, I have an idea, and we already talked about uh, the rules for arguments or discussions, but I don't want to change my mind. And as the argument goes on, I get more committed to my point. Do you understand that idea? Right? So I tell you that the wall is black, and you say, no it's not, it's white, okay? And then, after a while, even though I can see the wall is not black, but I keep with my point, I get even anger, no it's black, okay? So people don't like to admit they're wrong, they keep going even though they might be wrong. Another problem is groupthink, groupthink is when uh, <coughs> We have a number of people who have the same background, we mentioned before, okay? Uh, in the financial crisis, we had white males, 40 to 50 years old. They all went to the similar university, okay? Their school kids went to the same school. They had the same kind of thinking. So they weren't thinking differently than the other people. So they all had the same kind of thinking, and they didn't want to come out of the box, or be different, okay? Uh, group shift. Group shift is like, uh, we have, I saw a video on the internet once, where some guy was stabbed in the metro station. Do you understand, stabbed? Yeah. And he had some wound. And then they showed all the people walking past, okay? So just, nobody stopped. But if you were by yourself, and he was by himself, then maybe you would stop. Okay? But there's like some protection in the group. Do you understand what I mean? So everybody keeps walking because everybody else is walking. Right? Nobody else is stopping to help the guy, so I don't need to stop either. I can keep going. Okay? But if I was just by myself, maybe I would stop and help the guy. Okay? Can you understand that idea, psychology? So it means that maybe we, I know that all of the board is making a bad decision about the mortgages, for example. The board is making a bad decision, but I feel safe. Why? Because it's not just me making that decision. There's 12 people making the decision, or 6 people making the decision. Okay? It's so, like herding. A little bit like herding, yeah. Safety in the herd, right? I feel safer because of the group. So because of all of these group dynamics, we can have a problem with the current system, where just we have top-down and just board of directors, right? 
The board are all the same background. They all have the same idea. Okay. They could be overconfidence, anchoring. They might feel it's okay to make a bad decision because we're all making the bad decision together. Do you have any question about this psychological issues? No? Do you have any psychological, any of these psychological things? Do you think? Everybody has. They're like psychological traps, right? You might do the same. I might do the same in the group, right? All the group is doing the bad thing, so I think it's okay to do the bad thing, okay? Or just, I don't consider the other people's opinions. People in my group are from the same background, so we're all right, and I don't want to think about people's idea from another background. So then, uh, let's move on to the next part. So lack of external accountability and control. So who's controlling the board of directors? So currently we have the board of directors, they are controlling the managers, right? But who's controlling the board of directors? The shareholders appoint them, right? But we have the problem that the shareholders are the owners. We saw the problem with the institutional investors, okay? And also with the small shareholders. So they're not really being controlled. They decide their own pay. Who decides to pay for the board of directors? They decide their own pay. They, make, they, they decide who is the auditor, who's going to audit them. So not a ideal. And then we have information overload. So they don't have enough time, they don't spend enough time, and they may not be educated to know about business, or about the environment, or about the social issues, or about any other issues. So these are the criticisms of the current system. Okay? Do you understand the criticism? Communication can break down somewhere, we saw. We can have some group dynamic problem. No, no accountability and too much information. So now, this idea of network governance tries to solve these problems. Okay? It tries to solve the problem of communication risks by cross-checking. Cross-checking improves communications. So if we get the communication from different areas, then we can have this idea of cross-checking. <coughs> so, uh, we can look at these improvements in a little bit more detail. Okay. So, just we can see the examples here of communication breakdown. Lehman Brothers, in the Wall Street crisis, we saw the video. There was bad loans and risk, right? They were giving the bad loan to the people. But why didn't that information get to the top of the company? Okay. The problem was they were not able to see that risk from the top. They couldn't get to, to see the risk from the top of the organization. <clears throat> so uh, we said that we allow cross-checking. <coughs> cross-checking of data and facts means that journalists do cross-checking every day. The journalist doesn't just accept fact from one person. Okay? They don't say, just this person said this, so it's true. They try to find other sources for the facts. Okay? Uh, so we have this idea of the stakeholder council advising the board. Uh, it's called a compound board. So nowadays, companies like, do you know HP and Shell? Do you know Shell? big oil company, and HP is consultancy and uh, company. They use this so-called uh, stakeholder council and the board, okay? So here's an example. We have this kind of compound board. This is a company in Spain called Mon Montregon. So they have a management board with six or eight members. Okay, that's just our general normal board of directors, okay? Then we have a supervisory board to supervise the manager correctly. Then we have a watchdog council. Okay? Uh, do you understand watchdog? 
watchdog like guard dog outside your house. You have a dog. People don't have any more, but some businesses have in Korea. They have the dog outside. It's a watchdog. Uh, so they are checking on the management board. Okay. Then we have the social council. So uh, social council from society, from the community, and employ employees. Okay. So we have these different councils who is advising the board. So this is like cross-checking the information. So instead of uh, the top-down, these councils allow the information to travel more directly to the board, rather than through hierarchical structures. Okay, do you understand hierarchical structure? Hierarchy is like that way, right? Hierarchy, employee tells their boss, their boss tells their boss, their boss tells the board of directors. Okay? But here they have a council for the workers. The workers have their own council. Council is like group, and then the council can tell the board of directors. Okay? So it's not getting caught up in the middle. They communicate more directly. <clears throat> so uh, the next point then is the separation of powers. Okay, so we, we can have too much power in just one area. So the multiple boards, this idea they have of many different boards, helps to make checks and balances. So if we look at an example of checks and balances here, we can see that in the 18th century, the French, the French had the French Revolution, right? They made a series of checks and balances that most republics, Korea is a republic, Republic of Korea, right? Most republics based their uh, constitution on the French Revolution idea, of this idea of executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Do you understand this? Every country has the executive, and the legislative, and the judicial branch in their country. So they have the president, executive, right? They have the Congress. Do you understand Congress? Kukwe? President, then they have Kukwe, and then they have the High Court. So the High Court is separated from the Congress. Okay? Congress separated from the President. So, do you know Donald Trump? Hmm? Some people are afraid that if Donald Trump is President, <coughs> he's going to do a lot of strange and bad things. Okay? But actually, Donald Trump can't do that many bad things because the US also has checks and balances. It means Donald Trump is not a dictator. Right? <laughs> so don't worry. Right? He's not, he won't be a dictator. Okay? He may be the president, but he can't do anything without Congress. Right? Congress has to approve. Okay? He can't do much. Congress has to agree with him. Okay? And the same. Congress also is stopped by the president. The president can veto the Congress. And then we have the judges. Donald Trump can't change the law easily, right? The High Court might say, no, that's against the Constitution. Do you understand the Constitution? How do you say Constitution in Korean? How do you say Constitution in Korean? The document they wrote when they made the country. Do you know what I'm talking about? Constitution? People have the right to free liberty and so on in the US. No? When Korea was created, they wrote the constitution. Very important legal document in the country. Most important legal document. Do you know how to say constitution in Korean? Yes. How do you say it? Onba. Onba. Marriage law. Onba. So, in the US, the court can go against the government. The judges can go against the government. They don't have to follow the government. Separated, okay? So this is checks and balances. Why? To prevent the abuse of power, to prevent the dictator from being in charge of the country, to prevent somebody, radical person, coming in and changing everything suddenly, okay? In fact, the US has some of the strongest checks and balances because the US, on top of the Congress, it also has the House. 
So that's one reason why it takes longer to change the law in the US. So for example, the healthcare. Do you understand healthcare? Every other country in the world has the healthcare system. Why did it take the US so long to make the healthcare? Because of the checks and balances. Okay? Just Obama wants to make healthcare system, right? Or somebody just wants to make healthcare system for everybody. They can't do that because the Republican, the other party controls the House or the Senate or something some other reason. So we need to have that kind of system of checks and balances. So the same for governance. If we have more boards here in the we can have more checks and balances against the power of the uh, board. Okay? So <laughs> the example they give here is John Lewis Partnership, which operates major department stores in the UK. It made a constitution, AMBA constitution, for their store. And it modeled itself on this system of democratic government. Okay? It made a constitution. And its governance is like democratic governance. Okay? They don't have just one person with all the power. They have different parts which can check the power. Okay? So they advise uh, establishing a number of boards and dividing the power among the different boards. Okay? In this way, we can also reduce the risk of individual bias or groupthink. If we, have the different, if we have a board of the workers, they might be from a different background than just the board of the very uh, the professionals who all graduated from the same type of university, right? So let's look at the final point then. But the, uh, we, we want to reduce the information overload was the other problem, okay? So we saw these when we looked at the ranking of corporate governance on Yahoo Finance, we saw these kind of tasks which the board has to do. There are five main tasks. Accountable to stakeholders, supervise internally, make a long-term strategic thinking, right? Appointment and remuneration, pay of the CEO, paying the CEO, that kind of thing. So we need a lot of information to do all of these things. If we have more boards, we can handle the tasks better. Okay? So they give the example of the Spanish company. It has 883,000 workers. It's a big company. Okay? Uh, so it's involved in a lot of things like insurance, R&D, right, so on. So the decision making we saw here, they spread their decision making across all of these boards. So it means the information is not too much for just six or eight people. We share the information among uh, many more people. Okay. Uh, Visa, do you know Visa? Uh, Red Cross. They also made uh, different boards, but they made them by geographical area. Okay. So they made here by function, but Visa made different boards in different areas, different geographies, to split it up. Okay. So, also they can have, they call here an eye on the thermostat. Do you understand thermostat? Thermostat is, I don't know if you have in Korea, but the, it's a device that when the heat goes up to a certain level, it stops, turns off the heat. Maybe nowadays you have a more modern way, right? But in the old days, the heating would go up to 25 degrees, then the thermostat would cut off the heating. So thermostat means that it's good at knowing what's happening. So if we engage more stakeholders with this network governance idea, we have a kind of organizational thermostat. Okay? So it means that if there's a problem or some risk, we can find out about it more quickly. And in turn, we can improve the competitiveness of the company. So we can see this in the John Lewis <coughs> partnership. Okay? Again, they make different officers for different councils, and it allows them to react quickly if there's any risk or crisis in, in the company. So this kind of governance can help to 
avoid the future crisis, according to these researchers. Okay, would the subprime mortgage crisis have happened? Right. So this is kind of solution. After the subprime mortgage crisis, we have people doing a lot of research, coming up with ideas about how to solve it. Okay. So they think centralized governance using hierarchy, right, top down, is not a good reason. And they think that's one of the problems for Lehman Brothers, for the financial crisis, type of top-down structure. Okay? So to avoid the future crisis, we should have a way to get the knowledge from all of the different parts of the organization and uh, put that knowledge together and get there quickly. So do you have any question about this idea? Net the idea of network governance? with these main points. Okay, then discuss with your partner uh, about the class. So, what are the main problems with the current system and how does the network governance suggest we should solve the problem? Okay, do you understand the question? No. So in this article they told us what is the problem <laughs> with the current system, right? What is the problem or criticism of the current system? And then the second part is, what do they suggest? Okay, they make a suggestion about a new way of governance that some companies are doing. Like we saw Visa, right? is doing that kind of governance. So discuss with your partner. So the last two slides are more important, right? What are the problems? You can see on the second last slide. And what is their solution? And give some examples. was asking me to break kind of about memorizing for the exam, right? So if I ask that question in the exam, I don't expect you to tell me all, all four of them, right? Memorizing, you have to memorize all four of them. But understanding means you understand, right? You understand the more important one, maybe one more, right? So you can explain about the problem. So the same in answering the question in class, right? Can you explain? Doesn't, you don't have to memorize and just repeat, okay? You have to understand what are the problems. Okay, and try to explain in your own word. Do you understand? Okay. Yes. Yes. Ah, uh, it means that they don't consider the people's feelings much. They just think about more about the economic uh, money. <laughs> Last two. 
Information overload is just that they have they don't have enough time because of all the information, especially if it's a very big company. It's a very large company, they have that kind of problem. Different countries and a lot of information. So they may not be able to spot some problem or some risk because just they don't have enough time to look through all the information. Okay. The other one is that they're not really accountable. The board of directors is not really accountable to anybody. Accountable means you have to answer to somebody. Somebody is checking on you. But they're not really accountable to anybody. Nobody is really checking them. For example, they, they decide their own pay. How much they get paid. Can explain the first question. You can explain the first question. What are the problems of the current system? Yes. Uh, main problem that uh, information can be lost, mm -hmm. and uh, for example, also they can be uh, can be can. Be, uh, some employee can say in the wrong way, and maybe uh, can. Uh, uh, so, and can say uh, another, maybe for example, sentence or something like this, and uh, another employee can understand another way. Yes. And uh, so the interpretation is different, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, also, there is uh, there are um, individual biases and group dynamics, for example. Uh, anchoring, overconfidence, and uh, something like this. Um, so also there are um, uh, there are little of external accountability. Mm -hmm. And uh, what does accountability mean? Ability, uh, it's ability to, um, um, how to say, uh, maybe to check and uh, to, uh, like, okay. auditors. So nobody's checking the yeah. board of directors, right? Yes. Properly. Okay, so thank you. And then, anybody, how can we improve? What do they suggest? What kind of system? How can we change the corporate governance to make a better system? What needs to be done? Who can answer that question? What should we do? We have those problems. How can we help to solve those problems? Change the system to network governance. Yes, what is network governance idea? Yes, but how, how does it do that? It's focused on these things, right? Minimize the communication risk, separating the power, reducing information. Right? But how? What's the how are they going to do those things? How are we going to do that? Anybody tell me? We're going to make those things problems better, but how?
Yes, who? What acts as checks and balances? Hmm? Society. Society. Members. Members. What do they make? What do the members of society make? Which helps? Hmm? They supervise. Suppliers, what are they making? What are they making? What was the word we used? Here, what was the word? Council, what? Or Congress, Assembly, Committee, Forum. They're all words we can use for group. Okay, so just groups. So we have groups from all of these areas. Okay, who's acting as the checks and balances and making sure the information gets directly goes directly to the board. Okay? Does anybody have any question then about this idea? No? Do you think it's a good idea? Or not a good idea? Hmm? Good idea? Right, so some you can see some companies are starting to use that. Okay? So then let's finish there for today. Thank you.